Uh, that's just one, one thing that you can do. Third-party data. This is, this is data that was available in some form, you know, uh, either in lists and tables or compiled. A person named Declan Butler, who is an editor for Nature magazine, decided to bring all of the uh, data associated with the Asian, uh, the uh, avian flu uh, into one place, and in particular, to map it on Google Earth. And what he was able to do was to count not just the location, but the number of uh, um, birds affected, the number of humans affected, and then plot this over time. And so what you see here is a sequence from 2004 to about early 2007 now of the spread of the avian flu. And as you can see, actually, it's faded out as we approach the end of uh, the end of the cycle. There's much less this year than there was in 2004. I don't think it's cured, but it's an interesting visualization. But you can also then carry this globe over and see it across the rest of the world. But the two biggest areas are Southeast Asia and uh, later in the sequence, actually, in Europe. Well, we have to wait for it here. And so there you get a sense of how the, how the data is propagating. And all of this is an annotation on a 3D map. And each one of these dots, if you stop to click on it, will give you detailed information about exactly that event and you know, specific about the time it happened. So this is you know, a very much easier to understand version of the data than was available in spreadsheets and in papers that were written at the time. And more importantly, uh, Mr. Butler has kept it up to date. And if you go load this file today, you'll see you know, much more modern data than when he published his articles in Nature Magazine in February 2006. The second area that uh, has shown some uh, interesting effects with uh, Google Earth is uh, Bahrain. It's a small, uh, small country in the Middle East, and uh, they're actually a very well-connected country, many of the people on the Internet. But um, when Google Earth became popular in Bahrain, uh, it turned out that uh, they discovered that their uh, towns um, that they were living in, the uh, Shia were actually the, the largest population, were very dense and, you know, typical uh, lower income uh, Middle, Eastern, Middle Eastern town. But right next door, where the vast majority of the Bahrain money lives, were these palaces, this being an, an example. And uh, Bahrain actually blocked access to Google Earth for several weeks. And so, in, in the grand scheme of the internet, which is known to route around any problems, uh, the internet was managed to route around censorship as well. And this uh, PDF file, which could not be blocked because it wasn't really Google Earth, was created by some of the people who wanted this message out. And this is 45 pages of very sort of explicit uh, demonstrations of the differences between the haves and the haves not in Bahrain. And this occurred right before the 2006 elections, which were still somewhat symbolic but the elections actually had a strong, you know, strong message that the Shia and Sunni Islam Islamists got much more votes than the government supporters before them. So I don't think things have turned around because the royal family still runs Bahrain, but you know, the message is clear. So. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Alec, would you care to share? Great. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here. I I'm going to broaden the terrain a little bit. Uh, one of the wonderful things about Google Earth is that it is liberating the geographical imagination of many Americans, I think. It's something we critically need to do. Because when you say the word geography to most people, what does it connote? Oh, the long list of what's the capital of Kansas now? You know, it's, it, uh, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it, it usually connotes something that's a list of memorization facts about, about the world. Now, it's actually enormously useful to know some facts about the world. I tell my students, you know, it's very helpful if I stand up, mention Brazil, and not have an image of Central Asia come thundering to the fore in your minds. But that, of course, if, if that's the, the beginning and end of geography, geography would be about as important and as exciting as learning a bunch of dates would be uh, if you were trying to convey what, what history w was about. And I think we've got a, a, a pretty interesting and fundamental challenge uh, right now in the United States because we have marginalized geography to the point where most people don't even know what to ask of it, what to expect of it. So, uh, you know, the map that I am just putting up on the screen here is I think the typical map that somebody would say, that's the map you need to know and understand to be geographically literate. 
and many of our surveys that uh, you read about in the newspapers that show some appalling number of San Antonio high school students can't find Mexico on a map, you know the ones I'm talking about, um, tend to reinforce this notion. And again, of course, it's, it's useful to have some sense of how the world is organized and how it's put together. And in fact, it's even nice when the media gets this sort of thing right. This was from a CNN broadcast uh, shortly after 9-11. They were talking about terrorist cells in Berlin. Fascinating story, but they didn't comment on the fact that Switzerland had taken over the Czech Republic. Um, uh, uh, so, I mean... Uh, so I'm all in favor of, of, of getting these things right. But what does this have to do really with, I mean, to memorize a bunch of places on a map is useful. But what does it really have to do with uh, the issues of the day, with politics, with uh, issues of, of war and peace? And I would say a whole lot if you can enrich your understanding of geography and your sense of what geography can do, as just a couple of examples Brian gave us, uh, help us to understand. Take something such as a concept which is batted around a lot these days, the Islamic world. You can pull a map like this off the web. The Islamic world, what is that? What does that mean? How do we use that concept? How do we understand that concept? Uh, the fact that, that it is used in a rather unthoughtful way is suggested even by sort of geopolitical models that you'll sometimes see out there. Look at Islam over there on the far right-hand side of the diagram. You know, there's Islam, there's the Islamic world. Well, when you frame a problem in terms of the Islamic world, you understand certain things and you hide other things. And I'm not saying all problems can't be understood uh, without looking at multiple scales, but this is a particular framing that actually has, I would argue, been a fairly problematic one in terms of a number of understandings that we've tried to, de to, to develop. It has fundamentally shielded us from thinking carefully about divisions within the, the Islamic world and some of the kinds of ethnic and political sorts of uh, fragmentations that are actually of, of some significance. To try to illustrate what geography in this richer sense might mean for issues of conflict uh, and, and peace, I want to just take very briefly, uh, 30 seconds on each, four conflicts that have at least been a part of my life. And it's, uh, it's enormously heartening to be in front of an audience uh, such as this. Unlike my students, you may remember things before 1990, or at least some of you do. Uh, and um, uh, just to think back about how different ways of framing concepts geographic, uh, or conflicts geographically uh, uh, attract our attention to different sorts of things. So Vietnam. I mean, one way of thinking about v Vietnam geographically was this area divided between north and south that fits somewhere on that lower map of the Cold War. And where was it on the Cold War, uh, in terms of the Cold War order? Another way of thinking about Vietnam was in terms of a nationalist movement that came out of some kind of understanding of ethno-nationalist uh, patterns in that part of the world and a history of Western colonial rule that's suggested by the other two maps there. Those different kinds of maps, the different kinds of ways of framing that, that particular conflict would have very different consequences in terms of how you would understand what's there, what needs attention, wh wh how we might um, approach policy in, in those areas. Or take the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979-1980. This is one of my favorites because as a geographer, uh, I think is one of the times when I first came to realize just how uh, geographical blinders could really uh, allow the imagination to run wild about what might, might be going on. The Soviets marched into Afghanistan. The pundits got on the television who were all experts on the political machinations going on in the Kremlin, and they were theorizing about what was going on, and the suggestions were made, well, maybe this was the uh, fulfillment of that historic drive of the, of the Russians to get a warm water port on the Indian Ocean. I thought, gee, have they looked at a map? Maybe even they realized that Afghanistan was a, a landlocked country and the idea was to move into western Pakistan. But look at the coast of Pakistan. There aren't very many big ports along there. That's because it's a very shallow continental shelf. You really can't get a major harbor in there in any easy way. These kinds of puttings together of the political, the cultural, the environmental is what geography is about. It was not part of the discussion at the time. Or then take something like Bosnia, the jump forward another decade and a half, the conflict in Bosnia. Various partition plans being proposed for Bosnia. This was one of them, the Vance Owen plan. It was based on a public domain CIA uh, map of ethnic pluralities in Bosnia. So, you know, if you had three more Serbs and Croats or Bosnian Muslims in one area, it would get colored one color. Well, this was a crashing failure, as many of you uh, may, may remember, and it was pretty easy to understand why, using some 
uh, data that had been pulled together by an Austrian geographer, I came up with this map of mi micro and macro functional regions in Bosnia, just how people moved around and used space in the pre-Civil War times. You can see there's almost no relationship between the black lines and the proposed regions on the map. That disjunction will tell you something about why people on the, on the ground were very unhappy with, uh, from all sides with the proposal that had been put forward. Talk about how geography can help us deal with issues of war and peace. I think that's a fantastic example. 